Howdy. Like all science branches, there has been people who established things in them and from where others took on with their work. One of them seems to be Penti Escola. Penti Elias Escola. 1883 to 1964 was a Finnish geologist who specialized in the petrology of granites and developed the concept of metamorphic facies. He won the Wollaston Medal in 1958, the Wettlesen Prize in 1964 and was given a state funeral upon his death. The mineral escolite is named in his honor. Eskola was born in Lelline and the son of a farmer, he graduated from the University of Helsinki in 1906 and received a doctorate in 1914 with a dissertation on the petrology of the Oriyarvi region. Eskola was a student of Wilhelm Ramsey. He visited Norway and the US in 1920-21 working at the Geophysical Laboratory in Washington DC and with the Geological Survey of Canada during which time he examined ecologites. He became a geologist for the Finnish survey in 1922 and joined as a professor of geology at Helsinki in 1924, working there until 1954. Eskola's major work on metamorphism was influenced by the work of J.J. Sederholm whose work he read when he was just 23. He began to think of the origin and formation of the granites and gneisses and came up with a method to classify the formation under different pressure and temperature conditions, resulting in varying chemical equilibria being achieved. So this is one of his papers, The Mineral Facies of Rocks. Penti Escola. F. Becke, U. Grubenmann and C. R. Van Hiese have based the study of metamorphism on the physico-chemical principle of readjustment of systems in correspondence with changes in the attendant physical conditions. I think this is a very interesting sentence. Physical chemical principle of readjustment of systems. So, in other words, this sounds to me that uh, the things which were there, because it's readjustment, they have been there already, assumably. Because they have been already once adjusted, now they get readjusted. And the physical, physio, physico chemical principle, in other words, they have been changed. Correspondence with changes in the attendant physical conditions. So they really have undergone some transformation. V.M. Goldschmidt first proved that metamorphic rocks by recrystallization may have arrived at the very perfect state of chemical equilibrium. I read this paper and I still don't really understand what they mean with chemical equilibrium. Maybe it's just so that it's not evaporating or dissolve into anything. It's just, it's a rock. It's there. Maybe. This conclusion was not the result of a study of the contact metamorphic hornfelses of the Christiania region in Norway. The present writer found in the rocks of the Archean metamorphic area in southwestern Finland a similar perfect state of equilibria, though with other minerals as stable phases. The writer proposed to use the term metamorphic facies to design 
a group of rocks characterized by a definite set of minerals which, under the conditions obtaining during their formation, were at perfect equilibrium with each other. Metamorphic facies The quantitative and qualitative mineral composition of the rocks of a given facies varies gradually in correspondence with variations in the chemical bulk compositions of the rocks. In other words, let's make it very simple. I have been drawing this some time ago. We have elements which are separated. Let's say we have elements here, which are red. Then we have another element, which would be here, circle which is therefore once again surrounded by something else and again by something else. A tendency towards a state of equilibrium is of course a general feature in all kinds of crystallization and in fact igneous rocks also may have reached it. Thus, we may speak of igneous facies parallel to the metamorphic. Both these conceptions may probably be headed under a more general term, the mineral facies. Facies. Yeah, I don't know if it's facies or facies, maybe facies. A mineral facies comprises all rocks that have originated under temperature and pressure conditions so similar that a definite chemical composition has resulted in the same set of minerals, quite regardless of their mode of crystallization, whether from magma or aqueous solution or gas, and whether by direct crystallization from solution, primary crystallization, or by gradual change of earlier minerals, metamorphic recrystallization. By defining for each crystalline rock its place amongst the mineral phases, have we arrive at the mineralogic chemical classification, the division of which the largest as well as the smallest, up to the very finest variations, are given by nature itself. Yeah, we'll go back to what I just drawn, but now let's have just a quick read first, still. On the first line we have the two parallel branches, that of igneous and that of the metamorphic rocks. So we have, let's say, original rocks, and then we have rocks which underwent some change, side by side. In each of them, we have as many phases as there are different sets of minerals in any series of chemically similar rocks. The number of the phases thus being a priori undefined, the system will be so comprehensive and elastic as to be adaptable to every degree of process and refinement of the science. The definite associations of minerals which appear in each phase uh, in a quantitative correspondence with the variation in the chemical composition represent the smaller divisions of the phase systems. An example of this kind of classification was afforded by Goldschmidt in the case of the Hornfels rocks and the divisions corresponding to definite, to definite associations were called classes. Just in case, I want to show you that this paper is rather old. It's from 1920. Yeah, now it's, uh, we are just still here, so it will come later. But anyway, it's rather old. Detailed investigation shows that the mineral associations of Variox 
of various rocks very often represent equilibrium in such a state of perfection that the characteristics of the ideal equilibrium may be deduced from them. Now, I have to admit, this doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> but anyway, it is therefore possible to use these associations as a basis of classifications or classification. In cases of rocks that do not follow the rules of mineral association in many in any facies, we may at least find, by comparative study, the facies which they have tended to approach during the chief phase of their mineral development. Certain difficulties arise from the specific kind of action of unequal press or stress. During stress action, no true equilibria are possible. However, the ideal equilibria may even here be used as norms of the classification as pointed out by Johnston and P. Nickley. We must also be aware of the complication that arises from the fact that pressure influences the origin of minerals in two different manners. By moving the equilibria towards the associations and modifications which have the smallest volume and by preventing volatile components from escaping whereby the formation of hydrated minerals is favored and the temperature of crystallization is depressed. In other words, if there is much water, there might be less going on because it's getting cooled down all the time. The importance of this latter kind of action has been much emphasized by an El Bowen in his masterly treaty treatise on the development of igneous rocks. This fact does not, however, lessen the validity, validity of the facies principle, as this only takes into account the actual mineral development with all components present. So, now let's we have we have to read still this I think. We have before us the task of investigating all varieties of rocks in order to clear up the coloration correlation between their chemical and mineralogical composition. The program was for the first time expressed by V. M. Goldschmidt in nineteen fourteen, when he had already begun to explore the Scandinavian mountain region with the explicit purpose purpose of determining by means of the material paragonesis, the zones of the mountain change in which conditions of different temperature and pressure had prevailed during the metamorphism. Shortly after I proposed the conception of metamorphic phases and the classification based upon it, without knowing of Goldschmidt's paper, in his first publication on the original metamorphic rocks in the Caledonian chain, the latter already used the phases conception proposed by me as a basis of division. Yeah. There is so much stuff here. Eastern Fennoscandia. If we scroll down here in this paper, like as you can see, it has some 52 pages. Metamorphic phases. So far as metamorphic rocks are concerned, the main lines of the phases classification will be comfortable to Beckes and Grubenmans and Van Hees' well-known divisions of depth zones. In other words, they can only assume that heat came from below. Because if a rock is transformed very much by heat and pressure, it has had to be, or it has been once very deep in earth. Because they are missing something in their picture. 
Thus the phases principle so far from bringing any revolution in the science may directly continue upon the work founded by those classicists in the metamorphic petrology. Classicists. Like geology in general for like most people, rocks are millions or billions of years old. Like where I where I am, we have one of the all the Earth's oldest rocks. But maybe it is not so. Because if we take this age classification like uh, whatever stuff they have used for um, checking out the age of something. They might be, most of them might be totally wrong because if there is some big solar flare or CME or whatever, like, I mean, really big, like as probably happens every few thousand years, it will transmutate all the stuff on the surface immediately into stuff which, according to those using those methods, would be then very old. So the thing is, I really try to figure out if they tell anything about how the metamorphism would actually happen. And it doesn't seem to. But here, if you go still down, we, we can see here's one of those. They are sideways. What to do? Can I zoom into that? No. Yeah, now somehow I managed. <clears throat> I just want to point out that we have here chemical compositions. Yeah, maybe it works now. No, it doesn't. <laughs> now let's try again for the last time. Something's going on. Anyway. We have those chemical elements, silica, aluminium, iron, manganese, calcium, natrium. K is potassium and others, hydrogen. And these are like chemical compounds and there is a list how they are like separated. And the thing is, I think if he would have realized that electromagnetism really separates neatly things from other things and if they are charged they may create other things and you know the electricity can do that with the associated magnetic fields so he would be i think very excited to think about this factor because how else nature could separate stuff? How else there could be mountains of irons and big ponds of salt and whatever else things you can find in the ground and all of a sudden there's a huge occurrence of something, metals or whatsoever, than in the electrical way. For example, if you go on Wikipedia, Electrostatic separator. An electrostatic separator is a device for separating particles by mass in a low energy charged beam. An example is the electrostatic precipitator used in coal fired power plants to treat exhaust gas, removing small particles that cause air pollution. Electrostatic separation is a process that uses electrostatic charges to separate crushed particles of material. An industrial process used to separate large amounts of material particles, electrostatic separation is most often used in the process of sorting mineral ore. This process can help remove valuable material from ore or it can help remove foreign material to purify the substance. In mining, the process of crushing mining ore into particles for the purpose of separating minerals is called benefication. Generally, 
Electrostatic charges are used to attract or repel differently charged material. Other than gravitational theory, which only attracts electrostatic or electricity or electromagnetism, magnetism, repels and attracts. When electrostatic separation uses the force of attraction to sort particles, conducting particles stick to an oppositely charged object such as a metal drum, thereby separating them from the particle mixture. When this type of penification uses repelling force, it is normally employed to change the trajectory of falling objects to sort them into different places. If we would scale this up to a planet-sized machine, something like Earth, and you would crank up all the winds, you would crank up all the electromagnetic fields we have on Earth, you probably could expect something similar would happen on Earth too. Like iron containing dust might be separated into a special place because of its magnetic properties. No, of course, it depends on the heat of it. Maybe it gets to, like, gathered in some places and after that it gets still treated with heat. And it melts and there's more stuff flying there and, you know. But it's, in a way, the same principle. Just on a much, much, much bigger scale. Earth's magnetic field is weakening. We have tales from the ancients who are telling about the aurora touching the ground. And as I wrote in my paper, or mentioned and showed, play tectonic issues, the influence of electricity in the rock forming process and a coherent connection between science, mythology and history of Finland. Yes, a very long title for a paper. There are no real plates here in Finland. But the geological setting is rather interesting, diverse, complicated. We also have uranium and lead. Yeah, they might respond to some magnetics as well. We have rocks and where is it? Lightning? Craters? More craters? More craters? Molten metal on top of rocks? Magnetic anomalies? Copper mines? Like the electrostatic separator? Like the stuff gets separated through electromagnetics? Magnetic fields and such. Also the size of the particles probably matter because Bigger rocks could stay in place while the small ones get carried away by the winds. We have Birkeland currents, or we have the Birkeland currents which connects us to the sun. And here is marked 60 degrees, and the plasma rocks are 62. So it's within this, according at least to where it has been as they made this map. So if Penti Escola only would have been aware of the power of electromagnetism, he probably could have figured it out as to why we have those metamorphic phases and stuff like that. They might be just double layers of these electric discharge events. This is a Birkeland current seen from, like, if you would look into the tube. And you can see how we have different kinds of elements on different places. And if you would turn it to the side and you could look into it. And I turned this 90 degrees because I think there could be some kind of a plasmoid inside Earth. So... 
this elemental distribution around the Birkeland current could explain why Earth is blue. Hydrogen and oxygen on a, are on the other side, as they are on Earth. And I just showed you now static pictures of a Birkeland current. And the plasmoid is somewhat a Birkeland current in a spherical form. Birkeland current simulator, I will put a link below to this. That's a Birkeland current. And I have no speed on it. Now let's turn it on. And you can extrude it. And you can intrude it. You can switch it around. You can look it from the front. And as you can... Now here is probably not that well visible. As you can see here, it is spinning in all directions at the same time. This might be the secret behind those metamorphic phases. The electrostatic separation within the Birkeland current. And now quickly back to my paper because it might be the only source where you find this picture. <laughs> Anyway, that's the surface conductivity anomaly here in Scandinavia. And one other reason why I think this is made entirely by electricity, the Birkeland current, is the amazing similarity of uh, this surface conductivity anomaly and the thing here on the right. The thing on the right is the polar cusp. The polar cusp is here. Incoming solar wind particles. It's rather up high there somewhere. But it goes into the pole and it goes out from the pole because, as you just have seen, the energy goes both ways. And this is a picture of observations of the cusp reconnection. And this has very striking similarities to the surface conductivity anomaly. Here. In other words, I think it's possible that this region once came down to Earth and created a surface conductivity anomaly and possibly also those metamorphic rocks here separated the metals from other metals and stuff from stuff like copper, for example, or sulfur and other things, uranium Everything got burned badly. So it's a pity that Betty Escola didn't figure out using electricity in the explanation because he got very close. But anyway, I tried to make now this video for several days. It's very difficult because there would be so much other stuff to talk about. But now I made a one about that. Bendy Escola, he invented the word metamorphosed rocks. So he is, I think, a very important person in geology. And he's a Finnish dude, or was. But anyway, I made it under half an hour. Didn't have to make six videos. <laughs>
But they could be made easily, like tens of videos about that. But I leave it here. Thanks.